done. Good. Okay. So, um, how many people know about every player already? Hands up. Okay, a few, a few. Um, how many people are using video in any form in their game? Hands up. Okay, okay. So, um, one of the things I think we found by working on every play is the the sheer joy that happens when you can show your friends what you're doing. So, what I want to try and do is just talk that through with you. And also, for those of you who are coders, to sort of show you just how simple it is, particularly if you're using the Unity plugin. So it's an open SDK. It can be used by any mobile platform. It doesn't have to be Unity. But obviously, we are part of Unity now, so it seems appropriate for me to show you the Unity way to do it, not least because I know how to do that. I don't know how to do it properly because I'm not an actual coder. I've simply sat there and done the tutorials and tried to work out how C Sharp works. Uh, and hopefully, you'll understand as we go along. So um, biggest problem right now probably is discovery. Anyone argue with that? Discovery on mobile games? I think that's, that's pretty kind of clear. Um, when you see a deck where we've basically had the same top 10 for about two years, and it takes a game like Crossy Rose to come in and kind of shatter that, or we get these occasional bites like the, uh, the flappy birds or the threes and all that kind of stuff that can shake our attention for a short period of time. It really shows how much of an underlying issue there is in terms of uh, engagement and discovery. So we have two ways of dealing with that. We can either buy ads. In fact, there's more than two, but let's say buy ads or reach out to other medium. But why can't we look at our audience and find ways of re-energizing some of that virality? and actually show my friends what, I, what I'm doing. And also, not just show my friends what we're doing who don't know the game, but also to help keep them playing and keep them engaged. And so we've got about 1,000 games using every play to do exactly that, to record games as they're played. Uh, and it's pretty simple. You know, you play the game, it pops up. I, I will show you this live as well. Uh, you play the game, you complete the level, it pops up saying, do you want to share this? Great job done, thank you very much. And there's a lot of fine controls over that. A replay is very personal. When I show you my play of this game, it actually taps into something that's a deep psychological moment of game playing. Because with games, they're about us being autonomous. We are the ones who act. It's not the story we're following. We're not reading passively. We are engaged in an activity. We are controlling which buttons were pressed. We are choosing which path. I'm not trying to suggest that you can't have active books or that all games are active. Some games might be passive in some ways, but there's something about what we do that matters in a game. And so when I show you what I did, that's automatically going to engage people much more readily. In fact, we've seen some fantastic stats, EDAR surveys, where we've seen a huge impact on the uh, relationship with people in games based on how personal the contact. If I sit there in person and show you the game on my phone, that's one level. If I show you on my Facebook feed or on my every replay feed, look what I did, here's a video of what I did. That can be incredibly powerful. Um, and also shows moments in the game. So how do we do that? Well, OK, so first thing is there's a plugin. So it's a pretty straightforward thing. Uh, we can set it up. It, there's an inspector. There's all sorts of other things. Um, I'm presuming if you've seen Unity before. Anyone not using Unity again? Might be some people in here, but anyway. So you'd be familiar with this kind of screen. So what have I done there? Well, wh what I've done to do that is to go to the asset store. Hopefully, we all know where the asset store is now. We just go there, and we download it, and then we import into our project. Now, there's a little thing we have to do first. Um, if you go to the EveryPlay site, everyplay.com, I think it, there's also one off Unity main site as well. If you go to the bottom of the page, they'll say links to EveryPlay. And, and go into there. You sign in as a developer, and then you set up your app, and you'll get a client ID and a secret ID. And that's what you need. You need those two things. Because you need to tell the game, you need to tell Unity that it's this game that you're going to share with. So once you've set that up, and you've gone into the inspector, and you've set that all up in, in every play, it's pretty straightforward. The documentation does what it says on the tin. It's very, very easy. And of course, the easiest way to do this is to use the existing prefabs. In that package, it's all the files you need, all the scripts you need. Um, it's all in there. You just have to invoke it. Pretty straightforward. Um, 
And it's about four lines of code, as I will try to endeavor to show you. So unsurprisingly, I'm going to initialize. What is that for? That's so that if you're using an Android device or if you're using uh, maybe an earlier iPhone, like before the 4S, we need to be able to know that because the performance will be different. You know, we're basically looking for devices that are 4S up, uh, Android 4.0 up with uh, 4.0, maybe younger. I forget which which one what it is off the top of my head. But we need to know that the device is compatible. And Android is a particular question because, of course, not every device is equal in the world of Android. So we have a kind of white list of get of, of devices we know work. And the way we you don't have to worry about that because you don't want to have to go checking every device. So what we do is we have this initialize routine, which is actually calling a part of the every play code we're providing, which is doing that check. Do we know the device the client has will work, yes or no? If we know it won't, then we won't show it. We'll have an, you know, you'll, you'll be able to find a nice easy way to not initialize that process, and therefore it's all here. So we know that it's going to work if initialize is OK. So that makes life very, very easy. And if we've done that, then assuming that works, then we start recording. So we start recording the gameplay at the point in the game you want it to start. Now, that might be simple. that You might say, I'm going to start playing the game and immediately start recording, and I'll record until you die. Fantastic, right? That's what I do. Start recording, play through, I get to the end, I die, now stop recording. And then that's it. That's the simplest way. But you could do some other things. So for example, you might decide that you don't want to start recording until the tutorial's part's over, or until they have like a minute or two of play. Don't know why you might do that. Different games will justify that. But you can decide where you want to start that recording. Every play, dot, start recording. It's, it is that simple. See, that's why somebody like me can still do this. It, you know, as an artist or a designer, you don't have to be a heavily deep coder to do it. And it also shows how quick it is to do. So what else? What else? Well, let's have a look. So, um, oh, stopping. So we can stop recording. Now, what I chose to do is one of the many ways of, of handling uh, this is to use the, the show sharing modal. That means using our predefined box that says, yes, I want to share it. I can review it. I can, I can send it to Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. I can print it in private email. You don't have to worry about any of that. We've just got this little modal that does it all for you. I chose to die and then do that, which is actually a little bit of a mistake, as you will find out when you see me do it, because the explosion happens to happen afterwards. So I made a mistake when I did the, did the coding. But it, I think it's quite an interesting illustration of knowing where it is in the code that you're doing these things. You can do some other things. So for example, you can capture thumbnails. You can pause. You know, we'll, we'll get to some of that later and some of the interesting nuances that that might mean. So what I ended up with is you know, doing that, building that to, uh, in fact, I, I did it to iOS rather than Android. Um, and then I did all the setup. So you went into uh, the project settings and set up the client ID and so on and so forth. So that's obviously a pretty straightforward way to go. But every game is different. And you may choose to implement these things in different ways. In fact, we, um, no, because I don't want to take the risk of the of the slide stopping working. I'll leave the demo bit till the end. <laughs> Normally, I rely on cables a little bit more. <laughs> anyway, so you can do different things. So one of the things I think is really interesting is when you play about with the pause function. So imagine we're playing uh, uh, a beat-em game, or we're playing a, actually, better still, let's say an endless runner. Endless runner, I do this um, fantastic run. I pick up all these points. I've done this achievement. I'm still playing. We've got this achievement. What if I had the option to pause it at that point and share this fantastic achievement, which would be a great piece of video, if that would be something I wanted to show off? Now, I could do that, but the player may not want to you know, stop at that point. Why do you want to carry on recording? So they could pop up this thing. Great, fantastic, done achievement. Um, do you want to share this? Yes, no. Carry on. Uh, carry on. If they carry on, then we just start recording again. As soon as you pause and unpause, we knit together the video streams. So you have to be a bit careful to make sure that they knit together seamlessly, but that's actually pretty straightforward, provided you think a little carefully about how you do it. But that's all about when you start and stop the gameplay. But if you do that, think about what you could do with it. 
there are other things that we can do. We can think about things like um, metadata and so on and so forth. Um, what's that one? I forgot what that one's about. I'll uh, move on because I can't remember what that slide's about. Oh, I know what this is. Ah, of course. So if you want to know how to do any of the functions in every play and roll your own, look at the contents of the C sharp of these two files. So this is the everyplaytest.cs. Everything you might want to know about the structure of how we call every play is actually in there. So you could go through that and work out how you want to use it. And similarly, um, when you want to use face cam. So we have this thing called face cam, uh, which is basically, like, pretty obviously, you're using the face cam on the device. Only works on iOS at the moment. But if you want to take the face of the person who's playing the game as they're playing it, you can do that. That's pretty cool. So why not capture the face of the player? Particularly if you're playing something like a horror game. You know, what if you want to capture their emotions as they're playing the game and then share it? If you're playing a horror game and they go, oh my god, that's funny. That's genuinely funny and people will want to share it. So that's the kind of thing, thinking about the emotion of what you're trying to create and the, the context and choosing the right moments to share. Making people feel good that sharing is part of the process is really important. Um, and there's a whole bunch of finer controls. So, you know, for example, why don't we put metadata into the video? You could actually put information about what that player has done. What's the session ID? What's the player ID? If it's a multiplayer game, how many other players are playing for that session? You can match things back later using analytics. And how do you use that? Well, we're not saying that every player is not a database itself. It's just that you're using the video and then you can use a JSON request to call that information and start using it in your game. So you could bring video into your game by choosing, say, I don't know, what are my friends who are playing this game? What level did they do? Well, if they did this level that I'm about to start, why don't you show me the three most highest ranking videos? So I'm playing this endless runner game. And for the particular level, particular world I'm entered, I can look at three videos of my friends doing that game. I can learn from how they played. I can see why they got those scores. I could even use that as a way of challenging them if I end up beating their score. You can make it much more immersive. And this idea of bringing your face into the experience, bringing that, it can happen in two ways. When we record the video, um, you can choose as they're playing to record their face as they go along. That can be good or bad, depending on the way the game works and how you feel about it. Not everybody likes that. You can always turn it off. Just provide clarity to the players, and they'll be comfortable. But also, once the video has been, the gameplay has been recorded, you can override it in their little editor that we have. So you play that game, you play back the video, and I can choose to put my face into it, talking about what I did. Can you encourage a community to build up stories using your game as the way to do it? Something's happened in the kind of PC world. It hasn't quite happened in mobile yet, but maybe this is the way that kind of thing could happen. Uh, I mean, there's actually a few examples. I've seen a few, some really good videos, particularly the Mad Finger guys, um, the, the uh, Dead Trigger 2, which is an awesome game, by the way, a really good game. Uh, but Dead Trigger 2, you have this... Um, these, these guys who are giving commentary on shooting, sniping zombies. It's like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! It's like, when you see things like that, it's like, that's the kind of stuff that people love to see because it's sheer, unadulterated enjoyment. Of course, in some ways, it's the ultimate selfie as well because we've even got an API. I'm not sure how public, you know, as in whether we encourage its use because I don't know how robustly tested it is, but I've seen them do this, taking the video from the feed, from the camera, and putting it inside the game, because that's actually me there in that top left picture inside the angry bot space. They've fed the, f the video feed of my face in there. Not sure you can quite tell it to me, but it's round enough, which is the important thing. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are people who are doing this already, and I'm, I'm saying these things because I think it's important that, we lo that you guys know that this every play thing's out there. It's there, it's being used by a thousand games, a thousand games even. Um, and that's a pretty impressive community. But on top of that, we're also building community services. 
So every game that posts video is getting its free community service site that's got chat functions and, and discussion boards and membership. You can join. You can think about the emotional value of people joining your game. I join. I'm a member of Skyline Skaters. That's a connection. That's a, an engagement point for you. But they're doing that in the context of these thousand other games. They have reasons to come back that aren't just limited to your games. It's not just about them coming back for your game. When they come back for other games, you're just a heartbeat away. You're part of a bigger community of games. And that's how gamers play. They don't just play your game. They play lots of different games. What I love about this is this, uh, they've actually implemented video leaderboards. So in that's this case, the guy at the top, Andrew, to prove that he'd actually got that enormous score. Um, I think it's enormous because mine's really tiny. That's really sad. Um, in my defense, I was testing. I wasn't playing. You don't believe me, do you? Okay. Um, but anyway, he got this enormous score, and he recorded the video, and it's fascinating watching him do it. I don't have the reflexes to do that. But it was awesome. But it proves it was real. So have a high score with video showing the guy playing the game. You can prove the game's real. There's no you know, faking it. This guy played that. You see what he did. I also now know how he did it. That's kind of cool. Increasing the opportunity, or the, at least the perceived opportunity, for people to try and compete. So all kind of good stuff. I mean, obviously, when you get around to the point where you're going to ship, you've got to think about this kind of stuff. Um, so, for example, at the moment we have a sandbox. So, you don't, when you're testing, you don't just blast video of your game every time you test, because that could get very dull. Uh, and also, you may not want to show everybody yet. You might want to be a little bit more secretive. I'm about the least secretive person I know, but uh, I know that a lot of people are very care careful about when they release their assets. So, you can do that. That's nice and easy. There's a nice, easy setting. And of course, we won't go publicly live until you've actually got your game on the market. And all you do is just put your, your app ID into the uh, website. Job done. Thank you very much. You can also do things like what parts of that metadata I was talking about you capture, like the scores or the, or the um, session ID or the player ID or the level ID. What proportions that you put into public domain versus keeping private. And it's very simple. You just go to the website and say, this is now public. And so when you post that video, nice and listed up all the metadata that you've said is public for that video. It adds so much depth. Because you can then compare these videos with these different games. You can see what someone's done. It really is kind of you know, even more engaging. Anyway, um, so I think that actually this still says coming soon, which it shouldn't say coming soon, because it's now here. Uh, we've basically tried. Um, actually, it's still technically coming soon because not all of the things we were trying to do was there. So all of this kind of the idea of having suggested replays and people following and comments from individuals and chat, that was a nice round, thank you, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and the color scheming, we're, we're, we're making that so that the, increasingly the game that you've made feels like it's your space inside every play. You want to try and provide more and more uh, finer controls to make it that easier. Um, the range of customization at the moment is quite limited, but it is something we're very definitely focused on making sure that we expand. Because it, it should be about your audience feeling comfortable in the consistent space that they already have engaged with. So now comes the moment of truth. Can I get the uh, cable to work with my iPad? It was working earlier. That is no guarantee. So prepare to be awed by the mighty majesty of a uh, classic Unity tutorial. Um, anyone who's tried to use <laughs> Unity will recognize this, I think. Oh, there's. How about that? Is that? No. Yes, it's working. So, um, you'll probably notice a lot of mistakes if you're a, a seasoned Unity user uh, just by looking at the size. In fact, my, my buttons haven't grown to the correct size. That's my ignorance. Although you should be impressed that I managed to do touch controls. If you know this tutorial, you'll know that I had to make, I had to find out how to do that myself, and make that myself. Oh, didn't update that either. So, this is what you'll get popped up. I'm only getting that update, by the way, because it's not a release game. You wouldn't get that in the real world. Um, so here, we, here we are. This is the show replay bit. I can type away. Uh, 
doing a demo live. And actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the video. So here I am, I'm going to look at the video. In fact, better still, I'm going to pull this up. And so you can see it's me. Hi. So here I am, I'm doing a live demo of the Space Shooter tutorial with Added Every Play. And now you can see my face as I'm talking through, waiting for myself to die, which should be any second now. So, me. Hi. Oops. So here I am, I'm doing a live demo of... Here we go. Oh, audio seems to have gone now. Why is the audio gone? Technology, yeah. Who would be who would be technology? Hi. So here I am. I'm doing a live demo of the space shooter tutorial with Added Every Play. And now you can see my face as I'm talking through, waiting for myself to die, which should So I mean hopefully that shows you how pretty simple it is. Um actually one thing I should do is this bit. I can share it on I should be able to share it because I haven't actually made it public. Um, if I were to make that public, let's turn private mode off. No, force private mode on. So I would normally have launched this game and I would press Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or emailing it to people. And I can't share it, damn it. <laughs> okay, so um, I then share it and I then go to the Every Play site and I can see other videos uh, that have been made there. I can do that from here as well. Uh, he says. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll come back to that. So, all in all, what I hope you get from this is that we have this system that's in place that is free to use, that is a Unity plugin, but it doesn't, isn't restricted to just Unity. It's available to any mobile device, as long as it's iOS and Android. Um, we don't currently need to support Windows Mobile, although that's obviously something we'd like to do. You can get Facecam on iOS. Over a thousand games are using it. There are millions of videos uploaded. There are millions of registered users uploading videos. So it's a great community experience. We provide you all the tools so you can manage the community for yourself on top of an already moderated experience. So we moderate all of the videos before they go live. We're COPA compliant so that if you're trying to run a community, you don't have to worry about those things. You can simply take advantage of the tools that are available and bring that information into your game with a simple use of a JSON request. So happy to answer any questions. I hope that was useful. I hope I've given you some idea of the kinds of things that we can do with it, and I'd love to take questions. There's one here and then one there. Um, if you want to record only the five seconds before the player die, is it possible? Yes, absolutely. Uh, mm -hmm. Moving on seconds. Um, so what we can do you see, is you can, in fact, I'm glad you said that because I keep forgetting to mention this. You can set recording, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, but only keep the last n minutes. So you'd have a minute. Yeah, I can't make it shorter than that. But one thing that often people do, because the thing I didn't do in my, in my very clumsy code, let's face it, um, was I didn't leave a certain number of seconds to transpire after the death to give that moment of explosion and death. And also, you need a kind of down point. You need that kind of tempo down point. <laughs> oh, God. ba -da. That's the thing you want. So if you think about that, there's about 10, 20 seconds worth of downtime post the point where you know death is going to happen, or whatever the, not every game's about death. I mean, it might be uh, a, a triumph point. It might be a reward and achievement is unlocked. But you choose that point, you go poof. And it's often worth going pause recording if it's the sort of thing would continue as well. So you, you choose the right point to stop and you say, now, now save the last n seconds. What's also really interesting is when you, you can take a, a, a thumbnail at any point. You can actually take multiple thumbnails as you play the game. The nice thing about that is you create an animated GIF. So if you, if you take a thumbnail at certain points during play, and then at the end when the guy has died or the level's reached or the achievement's done, and you get to that point, show a thumbnail, an animated thumbnail, what they've done. Because they don't know what icon means. If I show them a camera or the Every Play logo, I mean, do you know what that means? OK, it looks like a play button, if you look closely enough. But not everybody will understand that instinctively. Show them what they did 
as an animation, and then maybe you want to show them the last 10 seconds or whatever. The very interesting thing is the games that have done that, we've had feedback from the users saying, oh, can't we have a longer video? And we thought the time frame would be around a minute and a half. You know, maybe even 20 seconds. But a minute and a half is kind of what we thought would be about right. And we've got people who are asking to have longer videos. And they're able to get, there's no cap, by the way. We don't cap how much uh, recording, it's how much storage the device has available. You could theoretically run a game for several hours and record the whole thing. It's H.264 video. I'm not sure what that compression is. Something like uh, eight mega minute. Does that sound right? Five, eight minute, something like that. Um, so it's it's a pretty efficient codec, and uh, that will mean that you can record a huge amount of data on a few gig. But I'm not recommending that. <laughs> yeah, trying uploading that would be probably par you know, um, difficult. But there is a there's a fine balance. I think you know something like three to five minutes is probably as much as you'd want to do. You had a question. Oh, there was a question there first. Sorry, I ought to take that. No, you sure? You happy? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so <coughs> it's stored locally. Yeah. The, the video mm. like only in cache. So um, we, the the way the video is done is we want to make sure the video goes online. So you'll record it and it will be in cache, and it will try to upload. But what that does mean is that if you go back and play again and record another video, we will unfortunately lose that. Yeah. That's just the, the it's, a really ch it's an ongoing debate. And what we found is that the impact of having that approach actually encourages more uploaded video, significantly more uploaded video. Because they um, get it out of the cache. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's, a tr it's difficult, and I, I struggle with that because I'm a, I'm a big fan of offline play. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a challenge that we haven't we haven't really found the uh, right. the right answer to. I think. Um, so just a couple of things on. Mm. So firstly, do you have to kind of inform the players that that's going to cost them some bandwidth uh, when they do upload? Because if they're on mobile, it might be expensive. And then um, the other one is: is there a performance hit from just doing this recording while playing? I think you. It's worth being careful. But so far, given that well, you have a connected user. Uh, as most of this video upload is relatively small. So you're talking about. Like I say, eight meg for a minute, uh, and most videos on average will be somewhere between one and a half and three minutes. The actual downloads, compared to everything else that's going on on their device, is almost trivial. Um, if you're doing a half an hour video every time, that might well be worth actually paying some attention to. So I think you have to make your own call as a developer what to involve. I think it's always good to be transparent, but I don't think you need to necessarily always call attention if you know that other things going on in the game, it's, it's, it's a judgment call. It's, all these things are always judgment calls. And there's so many little things that I, you know, it's hard to remember to think about, like this idea of pausing and recording and, and being at a sort of store. Basically, the game will decide to tell you that you can't record anymore when you've run out of space, for example. Um, so there's a lot of things about just making a lot of things that we've already taken care of for you as a developer, because we know, because we've got so many developers who are doing this, we've been able to learn as we go along to make sure it's as seamless as possible. Mm. Oh, yes, I should have said that before. That's the other thing. Absolutely. And actually, the performance is almost zero. Almost. Obviously, there's never such thing as a zero, but because we're using secondary processor, that doesn't have uh, the same performance hit. So it's using the unused CPU, it's using the GPU. And the reason we can do that is because the way these devices work is that everything's written to the GPU, so the GL layer anyway, and we're just reading off GL layer. So that's why you're getting exactly what's seen on the screen. So it's incredibly efficient. Our guys are pretty you know, genius technical fins. You know what fins can be like. Uh, they've done some amazing work and basically made it so that we've tested some of the highest performing games using Unity. And also some not using not, u not using Unity, and they're still not getting significant hits. I had a fantastic quote from a guy uh, from Simutronics who did one epic night. He said he, t he switched it all on. He had to go. He was he was running the diagnostics, so he was checking frames per second, and he thought he hadn't activated every play because the average frame per second didn't change. I think that kind of says it all. You know, if you don't notice the difference when you run it on and off. That's about as close as you're going to get. 
Now, could you have a game that's so using every ounce of every processor that it falls over? Of course, you might have that. But typically, that doesn't seem to happen. I think you'd probably melt the phone or, or tablet in the process if you did. But also, um, th that's why we kind of cut off points at certain devices. There are certain devices which aren't particularly good. So for example, the iPad 3 isn't particularly good because it's trying to run the same processor as the 2, but with a much higher resolution. So little tricks like that, but we try and help you with that. And because it's all been thought through, there's lots of documentation. Cool. Question at the back? Uh, you can't, I'm afraid, no. Uh, again, this is down to the challenge that we have. Because we're trying to encourage a community service, uh, we've experimented with it lots of times. Uh, if we export to the camera, it, we don't get the uploads. Uh, and it's just a natural thing that happens with these kind of services. So we've made the call because of what we need to do to make that a justifiable thing to be able to do to make it so it's uploadable. So it's an interesting point, and I, uh, it, it comes up regularly internally as well. Cool, any more questions? So hopefully I've, I've at least tantalized you with the idea, opportunity to be able to communicate with your users and actually see what they do. My personal best experience with it, uh, I was working with a company doing a game called um, Commando Jack. It was a tower defense game in the um, uh, classic style. You put down a turret and it creates a maze, great. We saw people's first videos. No one was building mazes. So you had these, these aliens who were just running straight through and ignoring the turrets. And it made you realize when you see that, we need a tutorial. You know, our tutorial doesn't cut it. And that kind of feedback you don't get by talking to people about your game. You only really get when you see it happen. And when you see people then posting on their own volition tutorials how to beat certain levels, which we also had. That's amazing. You don't have to create that. Your audience create that, and they're better at it than you. They probably know your game better than you, and this is what I think this technology unlocks. So on that note, thank you all. I hope you had a fantastic Casual Connect. I have, and hopefully see you at the next one. Cheers.